I was born in upstate New York, uh, but my parents divorced when I was two, and we moved to Chicago with my mom, my sister, and I. I have an older sister. And uh, my dad and my grandparents and the rest of my whole extended family stayed in upstate New York. Uh, and so I, I think it kind of all starts there. Um, I, we ended up in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, and eventually uh, I ended up going to university in Chicago um, and uh, at a place called Northeastern University uh, where I started studying Arabic, the language, uh, just because I don't really know, you know, I, I, the, I'll come back to why maybe the family history part is, is important, but I think that the thing that really triggered it was I started studying Arabic when I was in college. Um, I was studying philosophy and English, and I thought that Arabic seemed like a really interesting language. Uh, I didn't know a lot about it. I didn't know a lot about the Arabic speaking world. Um, I just knew that it was interesting. Um, I think part of what drew me to it was um, my dad's uh, family background. Uh, both of his parents immigrated to the US from Syria or greater Syria at the time. It was still an Ottoman territory. Um, and they my grandparents or my, oops, you know, they, they spoke some Arabic um, when we were around and I always made a lot of Arabic food and Syrian bread, I remember, was one of the best things ever whenever we would go to upstate New York to see my, my dad and my grandparents. Um, and just that was something that I, I, I think was always in the back of my mind, but I hadn't really connected to the language and the study of it until... Um, a couple of years later when um, my study of literature and philosophy um, actually led me to studying and, and the study of Arabic led me to becoming really interested in Arabic poetry um, and Arab cinema. Um, but I think the, the first love really started with poetry. In translation, I had a, a philosophy and literature class I can't remember if it was philosophy in literature or if it was philosophy and literature. Um, and it was maybe the last year that I was, I was finishing up my degree, um, taught by this professor who knew a lot of, knew Arabic, knew Farsi. Um, he knew a lot about Arabic literature and he started teaching these really radical contemporary Arab poets and I was just sold. Um, and a year later, I ended up applying to PhD programs. Um, I wanted really desperately to move out of Chicago and really out of the Midwest in general. So I applied for schools that were on both coasts, mostly. And the only school that I applied to that was in the Midwest was the University of Minnesota, um, mostly because when I first got the idea that I wanted to maybe get a PhD and study literature um, and continue studying Arabic poetry, even though I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do with that. Um, the first program that I found was the Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature Department at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I read all about it and read all about the professors and I was like, this, this, this grad school, this sounds like something I could do. And I remember talking to my professors uh, at the time and they uh, they said, well, it's a hard program. You should apply though. There's a lot of really good people there. Um, I think you'll, you know, I think that, I think you'd fit in well there. Um, but I remember thinking, you know, that'll just be the, you know, I'll apply there, but I really want to go somewhere that's on one of these two coasts. Um, and when I started getting acceptances and rejections, probably more rejections, I'm not sure even how many applications I sent out for graduate school now, it was so long ago. Um, this was the first one that I received from the University of Minnesota, and uh, I remember thinking like, okay, well, that's, that's good, we'll keep that in the sort of back pocket, but still want to like make sure to go somewhere else. Uh, and then after getting accepted to a couple places on the coast and visiting all of the schools, I thought, this, I was just kind of sold on the Twin Cities and um, on the department and the professors there that I met when I came up here to visit the school. Um, so 
That, I, I suppose, is how I ended up in the Twin Cities. Um, and I'm still in that PhD program. I'll be finishing this year. Um, my research is, is still on um, Arab literature, but more focused on Arab American literature and uh, Arab cinema. Um, one of the things that I think happened, um, and one of the things that's maybe led to why I'm here today, um, is I, in my first or second year, of, or I think it was my second year of graduate school, I took a, an independent study with a filmmaker, Hisham Bizri, who was also a professor in the department at the time. <clears throat> and he, um, you know, he just gave me and a friend who was also doing an independent study a list of Arab films to watch. And so, you know, all of these classic films, some of which I'd seen, some of which I hadn't, uh, and it was, it was really great. You know, he had many copies of them on VHS tapes and, uh, and on DVD, and um, some of them we had to like ILL or find strange YouTube videos of them uh, in order to watch the films. Um, and then he had mentioned that the Arab Film Festival in town. He said, "I know they're doing some. They're doing a screening committee." Um, if you're interested, I can I can send you the information um, of the director and the curator, and maybe you can go and and watch some films with them, more contemporary films, and and so I did, and and you know now it's probably six years later, and now I'm the director and curator of the Arab Film Festival, and I've been working with Misna ever since, um, and. I think that finding Mizna, Mizna is a local nonprofit that used to be based in Northeast, uh, but in 2011, actually right around the time that I started working with them, they moved to St. Paul. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in any case, there it's an it's a nonprofit that organizes the Arab Film Festival in town, but then also puts out one of the only. Uh, Arab American literary journals that exists, um, mostly printed in English, but um, there are also sometimes some some things that come in Arabic. Uh, although there's always translations, and there's also visual art in the journal. Um, and finding Mizna was something that I think really when I was when I first moved to the Twin Cities, I, I really loved it, but I missed Chicago a lot. Um, and even though I was uh, desperately trying to get out of there. Of course, it was home, and I'd lived there for, um, I don't know, 29 years or something like that, so I'd been there a while. And um, when uh, when I found Mizna, I think it was, and the film festival and that work, it was really grounding in a way that, that grad school can often feel like you're working by yourself, you're doing a lot of you know, you're reading a lot and you have classes, but especially once you're done with coursework, you know, you're doing a lot of things on your own, you're reading on your own, you're writing on your own. So something about finding the film festival and doing that work has just been, and working with the incredible people there has been like, has been amazing. It's been really nice. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I got to where I am now. To be doing what I'm doing. A lot of big entities in your history. Yeah. Um, one to start with is Chicago. Yes. Just visited. What does oh. Chicago mean to you? Oh. Uh, what? Uh, it's home, I guess. It's home. Uh, it's. It's. I feel pretty grounded here and rooted here now. I'm, there's. I have so many things that I'm doing here and so many people and. Um, different organizations that I work with and um, different places that I really love. But I, I think Chicago is just, um, I moved to the city when I was 19 and lived there until I was 29 um, when I moved here. And I grew up in the suburbs and so I think for a long time Chicago was always just like, you know, it's where we said we were from, but because people didn't know where Mount Prospect, Illinois was, which is where, where I mostly lived um, growing up. But it was also, um, you know, it was like the place where we went whenever we were doing something really fun. Um, and then as when I, you know, moved out of my mom's house and, and 
lived on my own, it was just sort of the place where I, I spent all of my 20s, so it, was, it feels, it just feels like that's where home is. Even though actually none of my family lives there anymore. My mom has since I've moved here, moved back to upstate New York. And my sister lives in Finland, so <laughs> it's farther away. But it, whenever I go there, I still feel pretty rooted there in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's for me, it's an exciting city in the way that Minneapolis and St. Paul will never be, can never <laughs> be, aspire to be. It's true. I, it's partly why I wouldn't live there, but that, but that's but 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 just the the magic. Yeah, it's it big. It's really big. I think when I first moved here, I experienced that um, as a, a very negative thing. I remember uh, thinking there wasn't a lot. But the Twin Cities didn't have very much to offer when I first moved here. Um, I felt like I had moved from a much larger city to a much smaller place. I think this is the experience of many people who move from larger cities to the Twin Cities, because I'm not the only person who says this. It's a pretty common story. But that's kind of why I think that places like Mizna, and um, I also volunteer at the Trilon Micro Cinema, and um, just other places. The university, too. The university is like this really amazing place, but it's so big that you can't really... It's hard to identify with, even though our department is, is pretty tight-knit and... Um, you know, it's not a huge department. It still feels isolating in a way sometimes that um, there is a great community there, but there is something about having communities outside of the university because it's its own self-contained thing within the Twin Cities that really made me start to feel at home here. Um, and I think I, I, I think I felt the same way in Chicago, and that's why it was just a place where when I first moved, when I lived in Chicago, I mean, I hadn't owned a car. Basic, I had a car when I first moved there from the suburbs, and it got towed away, um, and I never went and got it, and just left it wherever it got towed to. Um, and then I just biked everywhere, and so I knew my way around really well. And when I moved here, I had just gotten a smartphone for the first time, and I felt like the streets were, you know, they there wasn't a grid and I didn't know how to get around and I kept relying on that map and it took me so, like Northeast where we are right now, I still get sort of confused and don't know where things are. Um, and uh, I mean part of that I think is because when you have a smartphone you don't have to like actually pay attention to where you're going. Um, but I also think that part of it was just maybe a resistance on my part to feel really at home in the Twin Cities, but I do now. It's a good place. It's still not Chicago. You know, so. well, Chicago, designed by somebody who had a, had a sense of if you're going to see a big building, you've got to be able to get a distance from it. And it's <laughs> got to have trees around it or you're not going to see it and then wasting all that good energy. Um, and, and, you know, the streets tend to meet at, at, at right angles. And, so much of both cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, is intersections designed by slightly inebriated ox cart drivers, basically. Uh -oh. and, and this is this is the well. But I, I, I live in here. I like that. the place. It's I like a good place. The, I like the idea that this is a place you need to live into by finding some communities. Yeah, uh, and there are such good communities here. Now the other thing that was part of big reality that was part of your early story was philosophy. Sure. And I'm, I need to know a little about what it was in philosophy that, that grabbed you. People who get grabbed by philosophy tend not to go on to film and Arabic <laughs> studies. And it is a point. way in which philosophy tends to, to, to channel people in rather different directions than that. That's a good point. And so I need to know a bit about what it was in philosophy that, that moved you this direction. That's a good point. I think I got lucky. It had some... I, so I went to a place called Northeastern Illinois University because I went to school a little bit later. Um, and... Uh, I went to school right away, but then I, I took a couple years off and went back. Um, 
And it was, you know, an easy commuter school close to my house, wasn't super expensive, and the philosophy department was really, really small. Um, and there were, I think there were maybe four full-time faculty. There might have been more, but those are, I remember four distinctly, and then there were some other people who taught classes. Um, and I think that our department, because it was so small, um, we had, you know, everyone was teaching lots of different types of things, and the department wasn't a very traditional American philosophy department. It was very continental, so I had teachers who were teaching things like Arabic poetry and philosophy department, and um, reading that alongside Nietzsche, and then had, you know, I had a another professor who she was teaching a lot of post-colonial theory, she was teaching Said, Edward Said and, and Michel Foucault and things like that, which I think that you, I, I'm not sure about other philosophy departments in the States, but I feel like they do tend to be a little more, um, you know, you read maybe ancients and then you do a lot of more logic type, pragmatic um, philosophy, which was just not the way that things went. And I also had a really amazing professors in the English department, because I was a double major, who um, I think many of which were comparative literature majors, and so they just kind of influenced me to apply to comparative literature departments, because it seemed like such a nice intersection between um, literature and philosophy, where you could kind of, or at least continental philosophy, <laughs> where you could do both of those things. And I think I always was a little more interested in in that, the type of philosophy that actually looked at historical and social conditions and phenomena rather than things that were looking more specifically at, you know, like doing a logic problem or something like that. Which I like that stuff, it's just not necessarily my, my thing. I'm not sure I even remember a lot of that stuff anymore. Hopefully, hopefully my old logic professor doesn't, <laughs> doesn't hear that. Uh, you'll get an invitation for a refresher course. <laughs> yeah, special, maybe. With a coupon. With a, yeah, yeah. One of those uh, MOOCs. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you remember what first excited you about Arabic poetry? I think it was just the language. I liked, well, and the way that it brought, um, I think it was a poet called Adonis, who is still living, Syrian poet, who lives in exile in Paris. Um, and we read a poem called A Grave for New York um, in this class that I was taking. And his, his language was really just sharp and it was really critical of the U.S.'s intercolonial and imperial interventions, um, processes of globalization. And I think I had never read a poem that I thought just really um, made a lot of sense for the world that we were living in right now that had been written decades before. Um, there was just something about... Um, this must have been in a, around 2003, 2004. Um, and so, you know, the U.S. had just sort of invaded Iraq again. Um, and I think that was, I was in my early 20s and I think starting to become a little more politically aware and especially because of the types of classes I was taking. And I just, there was something about it that, I don't know, triggered an interest in just like knowing more about the history, both of how the U.S., um, how U.S. foreign policy and intervention affects countries that I don't, have never been to and, and haven't really thought about in any real way. Even sort of going back to thinking about, you know, my dad always referred to himself as Syrian, but he, you know, it's like the Syria that his parents immigrated from when they were very small um, that, you know, was, like I said, it was an Ottoman territory. It wasn't the country that we know now. It's something really different. Uh, and so thinking about this poet living in, writing in Arabic, living in Paris, writing about the Vietnam War, because this was in the 70s, uh, and 
um, you know, like publishing in Beirut and there like a lot of intersections and thinking about like his response to the first time he tr visited New York City or one of the times he visited New York City, just it opened up all kinds of possibilities, I think, for me and thinking about things that poetry could do that I don't know that I had thought about before. <laughs> and kind of moving down the list of big things, uh, sure. do you recall do you recall how you first came in to be involved with with or to 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 be grabbed by uh, Arab film, Arabic filmmaking. Um, yeah, actually, I think. Well, I think during that period of time, when I was watching, when I was doing that independent study at the U, um, on Arab cinema, I watched a. a film called The Dupes, which we actually just, um, Mizna and The Walker actually just screened as part of our, um, a film series that we're doing called Reshaping Our World Cinema Without Borders. Um, and it, which has one more screening actually, on uh, next Wednesday, August 2nd, we're screening Abbas Kiarostami's, who's an Iranian director's Taste of Cherry. Um, <clears throat> and one of the films that we screened was this film called The Dupes, which is made by an Egyptian director called uh, Tufik Sela. Um, and the film is based on this. He, he made, he's an Egyptian filmmaker. His mother, I think his mother is Palestinian. His father was Egyptian um, at the time. He was working with the Syrian film organization, though, to make this film, The Dupes. Um, and it was 1972, and the film is based on a Palestinian short story written by uh, Hassan Kanafani, which he wrote in 1962. Um, and it's this really, really kind of amazing, but also incredibly somber story about three Palestinians of different generations attempting to immigrate to Kuwait to work in the um, to work in the oil fields because there's the recent kind of oil boom and uh, they have to immigrate illegally and the story doesn't end very well and I remember I watched the film, I think I watched it on YouTube, just like a really horrible link and the film was like just, it was so intense and powerful, it ends on this really somber note. Um, and. You know, the when we screened it a couple of weeks ago at the Walker, I think was it was the first time I'd ever seen it on the big screen, um, and we had we screened it from this older thirty-five millimeter print, but the print was really beautiful. Um, it was you know you could tell it was old, but it still looked amazing. And um, when the film ended, there was this kind of silence in the theater that I've never really heard before at the end of a movie. It was you know the real the last reel ended in all of the credits because it was an older film played at the beginning and so when the film you know came up it said the end and and then it was just done like it was cut darkness you know light started to come back up in the theater and it was so silent in the room in the this you know large auditor auditorium and I think it was very similar to the experience I had the first time I watched that film um, it was just a really moving story and a really um, just amazingly made film that just felt you know, revolutionary, even in, you know, even in 2000, whenever I must have watched it, 2011, um, and even, you know, in 2017, there's just something about that film that just kind of grabs you, and the, it's like, you're kind of, you're speechless afterward, and it was interesting to experience it with an auditorium full of people, again, uh, where that was kind of recreated in a way. So, what was it like to move from just kind of walking into this organization that does a film <laughs> festival to running it? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it sort of feels like that, but it also, um, I think, it made more sense than that. I, I, it felt fast, I guess, in some ways. I think I think I didn't really know the Arab Film Festival existed. Um, and, and then I, I remember going to see this 
strange Egyptian film. Um, I think in 2011 when I heard, I happened to see that the, the film festival was happening. Um, and because at that point, when I first moved here in 2009, the festival was um, on an 18-month cycle. Now we're annual. Um, and so there, I think there was a festival in 2009, and then there was another one in 2011. And so I remember I went, and I only made it out to one film. Um, and I heard about it, I think, because one of my professors, uh, who's now one of my advisors, John Mowat, who is no longer at the U, but he's great, he told me, he was trying to get me to introduce maybe one of the films, because they were screening an Ilyas Suleiman film, who's a Palestinian director, a contemporary director. And he said he was, they were bringing him, and they had asked maybe John to introduce the film. I kind of remember this. This is a vague memory that's coming back right now. Um, and I think that's how I heard about the festival to begin with. Uh, and so I, um, that didn't end up happening. The director didn't come, but I still ended up going to see just this one film. And I remember it was a really strange film, but it was the first time I had ever been to the Heights Theater um, in Columbia Heights. I think that's not technically Northeast, but it's near. Um, and I was like, this is the most amazing theater I've ever been in. Um, it's beautiful, and um, like, how did I not know that this was here? Um, so <clears throat> that was part of it. Uh, and, and then it just seems like it kind of snowballed from that point on. You know, then I ended up becoming involved with the screening committee and meeting Mohaned Gawenma, who was the longtime director. He was involved in the first festival, which was in 2003, um, was the curator for many years. Uh, and he, I remember just thinking, I was like, this guy's great. He's got really fantastic shoes. He is like brilliant and knows so many things about Arab cinema. I was like, and you know, every time we would go to see a film, you know, it was like 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings, we would all meet. Um, it was this amazing group of people, and everyone came from, you know, different perspectives on cinema. Some people just, you know, like, there was this woman, Lena, who was Lebanese, um, and just really loved and was super supportive of Mizna, and so she, she would, she came and loved watching films and had really amazing things, but she worked in, she worked at General Mills, like, I don't think she was a film person at all, and there were other people like that who weren't necessarily film buffs, but then there were some who were, and I just really enjoyed the people and learning a lot about current Arab cinema and seeing these films that I just, there was no way I would see them anywhere else because we, you know, we were always watching films and we didn't screen all of them. Um, so I think I just, I really enjoyed it and liked the experience of that so much that I, you know, was at the festival that year uh, the whole time and I volunteered a lot at it and um, kept going back to Mizna things and ended up becoming the coordinator just because circumstance Mohanad was applying to graduate school I believe and wanted to take a bit of a step back so he just wanted to do the program and so um, <clears throat> they were looking for somebody who could do some of the other work around the festival and then the next year, Mohanad got into graduate school and moved to LA. And so it sort of just made sense that I would also start doing the program. But I mean, I, I was so lucky because I had this amazing teacher, Mohanad, uh, who I got to work with very closely the year before and had, you know, gotten to work with the year before that during the screening committee and kind of seeing how he um, located films and. Uh, you know how to work with distributors and things like that so it felt it felt kind of natural in that sense and now years a couple of years later it just it's just part of the routine of every year because it's annual so once one festival ends you know you get to start watching more movies for next year and it's it's great we still watch movies though at 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings as part of the screening committee and we have an amazing committed group of people that come each week um, and sometimes the films that we don't end up accepting are more fun to watch than the ones that we do. Um, but most of the time, you know, it's, everyone is so thoughtful and um, like intensely watching each of the films. Some people are taking notes and we always bring snacks and just kind of, it's like a thing that we do now, Saturdays.
I don't know what I would do without it. Now that the festival's coming up in, on September 27th, we'll probably have a little bit of a break. That'll be strange. <laughs> but. So, you've got a good committee. Yeah, good committee. And you've got a, wrote, I've got a routine, mm -hmm. schedule, probably mm -hmm. written down. These are the dates that you have to make these calls, yeah. send these letters. That's true. Uh, and, and once that gets down, a whole lot of the, a certain amount of the anxiety goes out. Yeah. You, with a good committee. That's and true. Schedule. It's true. And uh, all that. Um, what is your work? My work? Well, I don't mean, I mean, obviously, you have to make sure that the restrooms are clean and the no pets policy is enforced. <laughs> Actually, I don't do any of that. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you know, they're all the, I mean I, I, you know, you do it, you know, to some extent, you're responsible for everything. But my question is, yeah. what's the work? What's the stuff that you need to do to make this thing go? Um, most of it, for most of the year, is just watching films. Um, and that sounds, I think, easier than it is. There's a lot. Um, we accept, we have submission page, and this year we've gotten, I think, around 110 films submitted to the festival. Um, so a lot of my work is watching those, setting that up, making sure people can submit films to the festival. Um, also tracking down films, reading reviews, finding things that are coming out, things that are screening at other festivals. Um, finding prints of those films, figuring out who the distributor is, sometimes, a lot of times, getting links to the films if they're not, if they're not available on certain platforms that exist uh, for festival planning. There are, in the past, I believe you had to kind of just get a screener, or someone had to send it to you in the mail. Now it's really nice, everything is digital, and so it's very rare that that's the way that we would get a film. Most of them, there are even platforms, um, websites that you can have a membership to and then films are on there and you can search by language, by country, which is incredibly helpful. Um, so, but, so it's sort of sorting through that page, seeing what's there, going, looking at all of the relevant international festivals, seeing um, what films are screening where, just knowing what's coming out and who's making a new film, when it's going to come out, and reaching out to them and making contacts with filmmakers and distributors and getting the films here. Um, so, and we're well, getting them to watch and then sort of making a schedule with the committee so that we can have something to watch each Saturday. Um, a lot of it is that. Um, and, then, and then, of course, the committee helps choose the films, um, but since I watch a lot of things on my own, I also end up choosing a lot of the films on my own because we um, we can't watch everything together. There are too many things. Uh, and then making a program and a schedule, making sure the films get here on time, uh, working with the amazing people at the Film Society and The Walker, who we partner with, um, to make sure that the films are um, here and tested and look good and um, and then just all sorts of other things working on sponsorships obtaining sponsorships for the festival reaching out to university departments and local businesses uh, sometimes writing up press releases but um, usually often that's the coordinator's job uh, our coordinator Jordan Thompson is amazing he's doing all the, the press work this year um, but um, I also work on writing up all of the program notes, so all the information that goes into that like physical program and on the website. I guess that's the work. <laughs> but the best part is watching the films. Yeah. So what happens to your head? I mean, you've got stuff in your head now, and it's getting bigger. <laughs> you know, the damnedest kind of network of connections among films sure. and you it's not just that you watched them but you had to watch them with questions like what audience will this address yeah. what is it going to work with this other thing that we're doing right. uh, you know how will it how will it what does it contribute that isn't said other places I mean you have to ask a lot of the same questions that a critic would ask yeah 
uh, and probably with a broader reach than a critic would have. I think that's true. So you've got, I mean, I imagine that this will occasionally generate an opinion or two. <laughs> you know, a, a thought about, you know, here's a sleeper, here's somebody who's remarkably underrated, who's going to sure. be the next big thing. I certainly get those thoughts. Yeah. Um, kind of what do you do with that stuff that's happening in your head? Oh. Well, luckily for me, maybe, um, I am also an academic and I'm writing a dissertation about, partially about Arab cinema and um, my research actually, um, what connects the literature and, and film parts are, is this question of, of networks and circulation um, and what films, uh, what films screen, what books are read, and which ones are not. So sort of thinking, already thinking about those questions, so I think it helps that um, I'm already um, considering that when thinking about films. And um, I guess I try to keep pretty detailed lists of things that I've watched and think of and try to remember, like keep track of reasons why certain filmmakers seem worth looking at again and certain ones do not. Um, I guess it just becomes like any other job, you know, you just get, these are the, these are the sort of materials that you work with and so you, be, you get kind of used to thinking uh, about about what director, what film, who are they working with, what distribution company picked it up. Um, you just it just becomes part of the process of programming and and um, and also I guess part of the process of writing or doing research or criticizing or having you know thinking about anything. You know you sort of draw on the materials that you've had the experience had experience with and think about what they mean in relation to one another and I mean I, and yeah I don't know I'm not sure how to answer that question it feels big it feels related to everything that I think I'm doing but not a couple of years ago I had a very gifted student mm -hmm. and one of the features of him being extraordinarily gifted was that he didn't much care about the academy. <laughs> and so the question was, what do we, you know, I want to read everything important before I die. And he had a shot at it. And unlike almost anybody I've ever met, he had a shot at it. And uh, so, so do I go to work as a museum guard? Or maybe repairing <laughs> magazines in the library? Or do I try to get into the academy? Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have a good answer for it. Yeah. Because it seemed to me, in terms of sheer access to what he cared about, he'd be better off as a museum guard, <laughs> especially working the night shift. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's a diff if there's a similar thing to you. I mean, you're in in like the best position in the world. <laughs> <laughs> To keep clear on what's happening in Arab cinema. It's true, you know. <laughs> your, the, your working time, your, your access time is going to be much curtailed if you get a tenure track job. I know, <laughs> Even right? at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, <laughs> where all you have to do is write a book a year. You're well, still going to have less access than you have right now. It's true, yeah. I mean, I think that... I think about that a lot. Um, well, let, I mean, I think also, you know, there's there aren't so many tenure track jobs around, <laughs> so I'm not sure, I don't have to worry about that at least for, for right now, um, although this is the year that I'll probably start applying for some of those tenure track jobs. Uh, I do think that um, both have, both being a curator of a festival and also being an academic um, have a certain privileged position in terms of access to um, both archival materials, but then also to any um, anything that's coming out now. And people, you know, a lot of times, if being the if I am looking at something for research purposes, um, 
you know, it's really been helpful that I already have these connections with people through the film festival because I can say, oh, you know, we screened your film. I'm actually writing about it in this chapter as well. Like, could you send me a link to it or any materials that might be useful? Um, so in many ways it does, that helps a lot, but sometimes it also really helps to have the, the university and the academic affiliation uh, for booking films or for bringing in directors. Um, you know, as directors, especially when they're coming from overseas, the idea of flying in just for one screening and one Q&A is often not that appealing. But if you can offer some other, you know, some kind of workshop or lecture or something like that, that's often really helpful. So the two speak to each other in a way, um, way much more than I think that they, that they, than they might seem at first glance. And I also think that my work has been, my academic work and research has been very influenced by my programming work uh, and my knowledge of the festival circuits and of how festivals work and how festivals are being programmed and what kinds of films are getting, um, are being circulated, are getting attention that are coming out of the Middle East and North Africa and what kind of film, what kinds of films are not. Um, so I think that, um, Really, I, my project at the university would have been much different if I hadn't started doing this work um, and hadn't started working with Mizna and the Arab Film Festival. So, it's been. The only festival I've had anything to do with in any intimate way is the, is the Fringe Festival. Oh, yeah. And uh, started out interviewing uh, Robin Gillette, who was running the thing, mm -hmm. and then for a couple of years, uh, followed people around there. And they are very committed to their lottery. Every so often, someone gets through the lottery that makes pretty much the entire executive staff wince. <laughs> you can just see it, mention that name, and they begin to want to dig into the ground. You can see it. And yet that's that, that's not enough to get them off of their lottery. Hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, how you think about that. You, you have these screenings, these careful, you know, decisions and all sorts of standards and so forth. Can you imagine going to a lottery? I could, yeah. I think about it sometimes. We get a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's, I was actually just right before coming here, I was working on a chapter of my dissertation, which talks, and I was writing about, um, uh, I can't remember his first name now, but Espinosa's idea of imperfect cinema, uh, where he's, he's talking about Cuban cinema in the early 70s, and, and this idea that in order for cinema to, become a, an effective tool of the masses. It needs to be something that, you know, we can't think about it as having these standards. It can't be like perfect cinema, which is this like artful, master, or artistic, masterful, uh, technical work, but that it's something, um, that it's something imperfect, that it's both made by, by he's saying, you know, the masses and the, those who are watching it are the masses, where there isn't this hierarchy of taste that's happening. Um, that determined, a taste which is determined by something that's external to us most of the time and not necessarily our own ideas, but these ideas that we have about what art or film should look like. And I do think about that a lot um, because we get a lot of submissions to the festival um, and because it's a film festival, we end up screening, we want to screen you know, the best of Arab cinema uh, and I think we have, we have so many questions. This is why the screening committee is so important. They're so thoughtful and wonderful about what that means. You know, what is, what is the best who decides is, um, and also, you know, thinking about, even just thinking about the idea of Arab cinema, you know, what, who does, 
who is an Arab? What does that define? What countries does that include? Does the film have to be in Arabic with English subtitles? Can it be in English? Can it be made by somebody who's European but about Arab issues? Um, I mean, I think that there are these, uh, the idea of like, what does the, the film festival space, um, and in particular, an Arab film festival, like what do we showcase? What do we do? What do we highlight? Um, how do we make the decision of who counts and who doesn't when we're programming? Um, I mean, like those, those, <laughs> uh, this might have been a can of worms, but uh, I think that that that's a question that we think about all of the time. We're always considering um, what what types of what are the lines that we decide you know, this film makes it and this film doesn't. And so I've always thought, well, what if we just accept everything that was submitted to the film festival, which is impossible because we get a lot of submissions and we can't. Um, but the, the reasons that we end up rejecting films and accepting others sometimes feel incredibly specific and then other times feel incredibly arbitrary. And um, I don't you know, what the value of each film is, is really hard to say. And, you know, just kind of another shout out to the amazing people at MISNA and the screening committee that I work with. I, you know, what I like most about all of them is that it's very rare that we'll stop watching a film. We usually watch the entire thing. Um, even if we, in the middle of it, we'll say, there's no way we're gonna show this. Um, for whatever reason, you know, it's representation of Arabs is too limiting, or it's um, too critical of this or that or the other, or it's, you know, aesthetically not, um, not, not up to our standards. Um, we still give it time and space and, like, allow it to exist as a film and, like, take it seriously. And that's the thing I think that I, I admire the most about everybody and everyone, we all do that together as a group and have never really talked about that as what we're doing. It's just how it how it works. Everyone just allows that film to to play through. And I really appreciate that. Cause it and it does it would be hard to go to a lottery system. Um, but I don't think I think it would just produce a very different kind of a festival and produce a really different way of thinking about what matters or what counts as good cinema, what what people should or should not be seeing. Like, takes that human element and out of it in a, uh, at least one level where it's just, you kind of take what you get and see where it goes, see where it lands. I like that idea. Well, I remember um, that when I basically could attend things for free, uh, in the, the old days, uh, attending a show uh, that was probably the most, apart from a toothache, the most uncomfortable, <laughs> and I would say useless, 45 minutes I've ever spent in my life mm -hmm. anywhere. You know, I mean, you know, including, you know, hovering and huddling under a tree in the rain or wrestling a hog, you know, I mean, <laughs> it was that bad. And, but, I didn't, but of course I didn't go to it thinking that somebody thought it was good. Yeah. I went to it thinking it won. <laughs> and I went, I left the theater really quite afraid to meet the guy who did it. <laughs> on the street because he seemed to be deranged <laughs> and this is true I mean I, I was careful where I walked sure. and then later I, I saw him around and got a little bit of a sense of, of how he interacted in the community and, but I I've probably thought about that piece more than mm -hmm. I have about anything else I've seen including some stuff which you know, should have gone, should have gone all the way on Broadway. Mm -hmm. The very best stuff I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I thought about that piece more because it's, it's so strange to me that someone would bother to do it, mm. and that anyone would want to watch it. Mm -hmm. And both those things are true. Mm -hmm. And it's on the edge of something 
that there are more central examples of you. Mm -hmm. I just mean mean that you know the the lottery thing caught something that is a very interesting anthropological example sure. at the same time it's a lousy piece of theater on virtually any standard <laughs> anybody has ever produced sure and i and i, I you know so I'm, I'm just curious i mean a lot of it depends i mean you set yourself up with a film festival as an arbiter of taste mm. yes and that's a burden you could give up. Yeah, by doing a lottery. <laughs> by doing a lottery. Yes. And then you'd not be an arbiter of taste, you'd be a facilitator of expression. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and, and I'm just, just wondering if, you know, how that feels to you. I mean, do you like being an arbiter of taste? I mean, the fact that they, served, that they showed it your thing Mm -hmm. Gives them a little. That gives them a resume item. That's true. When they go on to the next thing, and you can, you are contributing to the buzz about people. Mm -hmm. uh, you're contributing to the, the, you know, to, to the possibility of somebody ba building a career. Right. Um, is that something you relish? Hmm. Well, I think. I think that I'm not super comfortable with the idea of being an arbiter of taste. Um, I think uh, a lot of the ways that I like to approach text and film and things in general is not from that perspective, even though I understand that those things are part of how I it, it interact with media. Um, but I guess, I mean, you know, the parts that I think I don't like about it are, are very personal. They're and and they're they're kind of just maybe insecurities of like, oh well, what if what if people don't like this film? You know, what if they leave? I think that the, those are the things that make me uncomfortable. Or even I mean, that, like on a personal level. And then there's of course there's this idea that like I get to determine what is good and what is bad. I don't know that I like having that role, but I mean I also think that the university and film festivals get to determine that. And so working within those institutions and organizations makes it, I mean, it's hard to, to kind of take that away from those, these things that we're doing. Um, even maybe in the Fringe Festival, when there is a lottery or if there was a lottery, it would still, the space itself provides um, the importance more than the thing. Uh, and, you know, just thinking about a museum, for example, it's like the things in the museum could be whatever, but because it's a museum, it's like those are, that's knowledge, that's history, this is important. Um, and I think the same goes for any kind of exhibition or writing about a text or, you know, um, in academia or, or curating a film festival um, or programming one. But I guess... I mean, part of what I think is, is really important about our festival and about smaller regional festivals that do showcase cinema from places like the Middle East and North Africa um, is that the images, especially in the U.S. and a lot of the West that people get from this, these places are um, incredibly limited, overdetermined representations of what it means to be Muslim, what it means to be Arab, and they all become conflated into this one image, especially in a post-9-11 world, everything sort of becomes conflated into the idea of the terrorist or the extremist, and um, I think that it's, I mean, you know, we have some, there's a lot of things happening now with, for example, the executive orders that have been coming out to ban, ban travel from certain Muslim majority countries, which is what the series of The Walker that we're doing responds to. We're screening films from the countries, from filmmakers, from the seven countries that were originally named by that first executive order. Um, I think that that, um, there's something there that these representations do need to be undone. They need to they need to be out there. They need to be seen in the West and in the US because um, people have ideas about these places that are leading to um, 
foreign policy decisions that affect people's actual lives um, and war, like more and more wars that don't get coverage at, um, that we just become very blind to. And so I think that, you know, the political aspects of an Arab film festival are real. Um, and the idea of being able, you know, Hollywood cinema, um, even filmmakers from Europe, although not as much as those in Hollywood that is pretty dominant, those films are going to be screened in a million theaters no matter how good or bad they are. I mean, I think we could all probably like say that cinema, like more mainstream contemporary Hollywood cinema is perhaps on a decline, but I don't want to, I don't want to, this might be where, you know, that, that taste thing comes into it. Um, but uh, when it comes to films made by, you know, an Iraqi director, it's that that film has no life but outside of festivals. It doesn't it does it doesn't have as much of a chance of screening having a big commercial release uh, nationally or internationally. And so the fact that it can be screened, I mean that it relies on international and regional festival circuits in order for it to be screened. And so I think and for that filmmaker to get a little bit of money to maybe make another film. And I think in that sense, the, you know, the politics and the economy of it are really important. You know, we, we try to make sure, I mean, we're a small nonprofit, but we do like to compensate our, the artists that we work with, um, even if it's meager, just because, you know, time and energy and thought went into this project. And now we get to screen it and so, you know, get to show it and that's, people should be compensated for their work and so I think that while I don't necessarily like to determine um, who you know what film is better than another I think that it's it's important to provide the space for Arab artists to say something different than what the news media repeats mm. Last last question. There's a, a poem. I wish I had it. It's a quote, but I remember the 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 refrain, and the refrain was, "We are, we were too few." Mm. And the idea is politics is being made mm -hmm. by a lousy consensus mm. of ignorance. Hmm. And you've got the flashlight of, you know, you've got the flashlight of a, a film festival that says, here's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. What's the hope of the film festival having an effect on the consensus? Hmm. Well... I think that if we stop thinking that we can change the consensus, then we're in a lot of trouble. And I think that we live in a reality where visual images are still powerful and effective to a degree. and that people watch movies and they know how to relate to them. I mean, I think there's something in film that maybe doesn't, you know, there isn't in literature or theater anymore because we all do watch, most everyone watches films or watches television or and knows how to engage with an image. And so I think that in some ways maybe film is is a way to affect that consensus or at least the image that we have of other places. 